I'd rather have Jesus than silver. Well, we are concluding uh, our message series, Living with Less in the Land of Mourn. We've been talking about how we can look at the Bible and gain financial principles that will help us to not only manage our money well, but manage our lives better as, as well. And uh, Gary Johnson wrote a book called uh, Too Much, and a lot of the insights that we're sharing in this message series come out of that book, but certainly the Bible is just chock full of principles. In fact, over 2,500 verses in Scripture that talk about how to address money or to be good stewards or, or our possessions. So as we get into this fifth me message here, humble generosity or selfish pride, I just want to make this observation. You know, when you don't feel well, who do you go see? The doctor, right? You go to the doctor, and after you're diagnosed, your treatment, it might involve a combination of things, right? It might involve physical therapy, one or more medications. It might involve a special diet. It might even involve surgery. And when you're given a combination of treatment, the wise thing to do is to do all those things at the same time, right? Because they work together so that your health can improve. Each element of that treatment is essential and it works with the others. And the same thing is true when you are financially ill. You may be showing symptoms like late payments or no savings account or maxed out credit cards or overdrawn checking. Maybe you are showing symptoms of poor credit scores or mountains of debt or maybe no tithing or giving. And here's the thing. If you want to become financially healthy, you must embrace these biblical principles and practices that work together so that you can get healthy financially. Now, we've talked about three of them already over the last three weeks. The first principle you'll recall is gratitude, right? If you want financial freedom, you must be grateful to God for his provision in your life. And if you want to be grateful, then you must learn a second principle, and that is the principle of contentment because you will never be grateful to God until you are content with what you have. But in order to be content, you must live by a third principle as well. And that is to trust in God and his care for us. Do you believe that God cares for you? And are you willing to trust him to provide for you as you faithfully live as his person? Well, this brings us to our final principle that we're going to look at in this message series, Living with Less in the Land of More. Today we are considering the fourth biblical stewardship principle that will bring you financial freedom, and that is humility. You will never trust God until you humbly admit your need for him. You will never trust in God until you admit there is a need to begin with. And so these four principles, they all work together inseparably. Each one of them is essential if you are going to be healthy financially. Well, <clears throat> you may be wondering, what's the big deal about humility, especially when it comes to our personal finances? How does it help, right? Well, let me begin by noting that humility is important in all aspects of life, not just our finances, Nick Walenda is a high-wire tightrope walker. He holds nine Guinness World Records for various acrobatic feats. He performs without a safety net. He's a seventh-generation member of the Flying Walendas. He's the first person to ever tightrope across Niagara Falls. He's also tightroped across the Grand Canyon. Nick Walenda is also a committed Christian. Now, millions of people around the world have witnessed Nick's incredible daredevil feats. And his cheering fans, they always want his autograph. They always want to get their picture taken with him. But Walenda says he does something intentionally in order to keep him from becoming arrogant. And this is what he does. After the media and the crowds leave, he goes around and starts picking up the trash. Is that crazy or what? Listen to what he said one time. He says, I need to keep myself grounded, and three hours of cleaning up debris is good for my soul, he says. Humility doesn't come naturally to me. 
So if I have to force myself into situations that are humbling, so be it. As a follower of Jesus, I see him washing the feet of others. I do this because if I don't serve others, I'll be serving nothing but my ego. Don't you love that? I mean, here's Nick Walenda, celebrity, right? And he deliberately does something so that he can maintain his humility. And when it comes to being healthy financially, guess what? It demands that we also take a journey into humility. Our pride fuels us to purchase what we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't even know. <laughs> right? That's what pride will do. Pride will push you to depend on creditors to fund your out-of-control spending and entice you to ignore our Creator God, who the Scripture says is also our sustainer. And we all have a choice to make when it comes to the journey we're venturing on with our finances. We can either journey into a lifestyle of selfish pride, or we can journey into a lifestyle of humble generosity. Well, why should we choose to live with humility rather than pride? Let's take a look at the life of Jesus Jesus intentionally journeyed into humility and giving. In the book of Philippians, the Apostle Paul describes the journey Jesus took in a rich and powerful way. Paul describes Jesus as the unique Son of God who came into our world. Nobody is like Jesus. And yet, though he was fully God, he humbled himself. He took this journey into humility. Humble means to lower yourself. It's a place to which someone goes. Jesus chose to forgo his status of being equal with God, and he journeyed into a humble existence here on this earth. Listen to Paul's description of Jesus. If you've got your Bible, turn with me. Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. Paul says, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, nor to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. So think about this. Jesus was born to a poor peasant, in an obscure village, the Son of God was born out in a barn. He was laid in a feeding trough for his first bed. Jesus Christ, the creator of life, was born into and confined by a human body. Jesus, the sustainer of the universe, became a helpless infant. Jesus entered the world and began his walk into humility. His humility continued throughout his life. Jesus healed those who were ill. He fed those who were hungry. He defended women. He welcomed children. He even washed the feet of his disciples. Jesus ventured into humility. His resume didn't include a college degree. He wasn't elected to office. But even in his death, Jesus was humble, though he was and still is innocent and eternal God, Jesus took on our guilt and he experienced physical death so that we could have eternal life. Now, he didn't empty himself of his deity, but he did empty himself of his title and his honor and status. Jesus said he had come to serve, not to be served, according to Mark 10, verses 35 through 45. Jesus didn't follow his own will, but he followed the will of the Father. I mean, you remember him saying, not as I will, but as you will? Matthew chapter 26, verses 39 through 44. The Apostle Paul, in observing the humility of Jesus, wrote, for your sake, he became poor so that through his poverty, you might become rich. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Though he was entitled to all the privileges of being fully and completely God, Jesus emptied himself of heaven's riches. Jesus intentionally journeyed into humility and giving, and, and so we must ask ourselves, as followers of Jesus, are we following him on the journey to humility and giving as well? 
Are you? It's a good question. You know, a lot of people say they're following Jesus, but really they're not. Instead of moving in the direction of humility, a lot of people who profess commitment to Jesus, they're, they're veering off towards pride. Pride is a recurring problem for a lot of us. It's a problem because pride can be a detour leading to financial struggles and stinginess. And so we have to be careful about what we give our attention to, right? We have to be careful about what we allow ourselves to look at and stare at for too long. When I took driver's training, I remember riding in the back seat while one of my fellow driver's ed trainees was at the wheel. And he was having trouble staying in his lane. He kept wanting to veer off into the lane of oncoming traffic. And the driver's ed teacher said something that I've never forgotten. He said, it sometimes helps you to stay in your lane if you look ahead to where you want to be. Don't stare at the oncoming traffic. In other words, don't look too much at the cars coming towards you. Look ahead to where you want to go. Look at that point on the road where you're headed. And when it comes to your personal finances, this rule of the road comes into play as well. If you're looking at all those cool gadgets and things that everyone else has, guess what? You're going to want them too. Why do you think companies spend millions of dollars on advertising. Why do you think the Thanksgiving newspapers are just stuffed full of insert after insert, flyer after flyer of Black Friday ads? It's because they know that if you see their stuff, you're going to want it. In fact, I got a little chuckle from a member of our church this week who posted on Facebook, I have to stop looking at all the ads. It just makes me want to go out and shop. We can relate to that, can't we? We start drifting off course when our eye is consumed by something. That's when you find you're buying what you don't need with money you don't have to impress people you don't even know. <laughs> Someone walks past you in designer jeans and new shoes. Ooh, and then you want a pair. <laughs> Someone parks next to you with a new Mustang or a new Camaro. Ooh, I got to have one of those. Of course, in a different color, right? Someone who stood in line for hours to get that next new smartphone on Black Friday is showing you all its features, and you're going, i got to get me one of those too. You know what? Just as babies cry for attention, we want the attention of people around us. And it doesn't matter if we know them or not. We want their heads to turn in our direction to see what we have and to see what we're doing. But I'm telling you, that kind of self-promoting leads to financial self-destruction. Proverbs 16, 18, it says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. James 4, 6, it teaches us that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And Jesus himself said, For those who exalt themselves, they will be humbled. But those who humble themselves, they will be what? exalted, Matthew 23, 12. So don't be detoured by pride and selfishness. It leads to personal and financial ruin. Now, keep in mind, humility isn't thinking less of yourself, but it's thinking of yourself less often. Humility is putting others before you and putting their needs before your own. Humility is thinking more highly of others than you think of yourself. Humility isn't something done to you, it's something that you do. It's the kind of person you are becoming because you are following Jesus. Now Jesus understands that greed easily grips the human heart. He, he gets that. And that's why he talks so often about greed in comparison to generosity so often. He confronts the reality of our greed, but you want to know something about Jesus? Generosity is what really catches his attention. Generosity really catches the attention of Jesus. One day in the final week of his life, when people were in Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Passover, Jesus was people watching. He was just kind of standing there watching everybody around him. He was tired, and so he sat down. But you know what? More than just being physically tired, he was tired of what he was seeing over and over and over again. And at one point, something about someone caught Jesus' attention. So much so that he called his disciples over to his side. 
Because Jesus wanted to leave them with a serious lesson on life. And we catch some of the intensity of that teaching moment when we see Jesus begins his words with, truly I tell you. It's his way of saying, listen up, people. This is important. Just as this person caught Jesus' attention, he wants his observation to be caught by their attention as well. Turn in your Bible to Mark chapter 12, verses 41 through 44. Second book of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Listen as I read from Mark chapter 12, verses 41 through 44. Here's what it says. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put, and he watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. So Jesus sees what this widow does, and then he gives us another way to count the offering. See, we tend to think at first that other people give more based on the amount of money that they give to God. And yet, according to Jesus' way of looking at things, this widow gave more because she kept nothing back for herself. Her offering cost her everything. The widow completely trusted in God for her next meal. The widow completely trusted in God for her night's sleep and everything else about her life. In that ancient culture, a widow was powerless. Women often outlived their husbands. And that's why grown children were supposed to care for them. When Jesus said that she put in everything on which she had to live, he reveals that she had no one to help her. She's alone. She didn't have social security. She didn't have a life insurance policy to cash in and live off of. Her actions shouted devotion, and her devotion to God caught the attention of Jesus that day. And so we need to ask ourselves a question this morning. When Jesus watches our giving, does it catch his attention like the widow's giving did? There are some lessons from the generous poverty-stricken widow that Jesus wants us to learn. For instance, one lesson is that no one is too poor to give. You know, a lot of times we try to get out of giving, don't we, by saying, oh, I'm too poor, I can't afford to give. But God doesn't buy this excuse. The widow blew that excuse right out of the water with her giving, didn't she? Most of us have been at a place where we thought we were too poor to give, and so we didn't, but no one is too poor to give. Not students, not single moms, not divorced dads or young marrieds, not retirees or widows or widowers, not the unemployed, not the underemployed, not those with debt, not those who are trying out new jobs and just starting into the job market. No one is too poor to give. Here's another lesson Jesus wants us to learn. You will never learn to give to God until you humbly Trust him. Now, here's where I've got a confession to make. You know, maybe, maybe you're like me and you're kind of saying to yourself right now, well, I can't even comprehend giving to God everything that I have on which to live. I really can't comprehend that. She gave everything she had on which to live. How would she eat? How would she sleep at night? I want to know, where's, where's that all coming from? But I'm willing to bet that the reason this woman was able to put all of her money into the offering that day is because she learned to humbly trust God throughout the years. And she had found him always to be more than faithful. This wasn't the first time that this widow gave all she had. It wouldn't be the last. She had learned to humbly trust God, have you? We trust in God for our eternal life after we die, so why don't we trust in him to provide for our needs right now while we live? When we learn to humbly trust God, that's when we become the kind of person who naturally gives to God and gives abundantly. And that's when we give cheerfully, as the Bible says. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, Paul says that God loves a cheerful what? A cheerful giver. Talk about getting Jesus' attention. 
When we're generous, it impacts God himself. Our generous giving warms the heart of God. It ought to cause a smile to come across our face every time we tithe or we give of our offerings. Now, if you're looking for a way to do that, to be a cheerful giver, then I want to call your attention to page 20 on the study guides that I put together to supplement this, this sermon series. Page 20. I've titled this, this page, My Commitment to Serving God's Purposes with My Life and Finances. This is your opportunity to make the kinds of commitments that go along with generous giving. And so you have some choices to think about. Choices like praying regularly for Community Christian Church for our ministry and our outreach. Commitments like intentionally participating with Community Christian Church in its worship and Bible study. And commitment choices like tithing and giving towards special projects and causes. These are all ways that you can partner with God and partner with our church through humble, generous giving. Now, I'm not asking you to turn this page in. I'm not asking you to necessarily even talk about it with anyone. But I am asking you to get intentional with God about turning your life and your finances over to him. That's what I'm asking you to do. Get intentional with God about what you are willing to commit to. Check those boxes off if you're willing to do that and devote it to him. Now maybe right now you're going, man, this seems impossible to do. I can't do that. Your life's flowing in a, in a direction that just makes that kind of giving not going to happen. <laughs> but I want to close today with a story that I first heard when my wife and I were on a tour bus down in Chicago. The tour guide spoke over the bus's PA system telling us about the different sights and sounds and highlights of Chicago as we drove around. And at one point, we were stopped at a traffic light above the Chicago River, and he started talking about the Chicago River. And he shared how right now that is a pretty clean river, but it hadn't always been that way. In 1871, for instance, when the great Chicago fire destroyed much of the city, burning building after building after building, even the river itself caught on fire. It's like, what? How does that happen? The river caught on fire? Here's the thing. It was so contaminated with sewage and animal waste that it was highly combustible and it started burning along with the rest of the fire. And not only did Chicago struggle to survive in the aftermath of that fire, but thousands of people were dying of waterborne diseases like cholera and typhoid fever because the water flowing out of that river into Lake Michigan was contaminating the source of their drinking water. So city leaders in Chicago, they decided that they were going to try to reverse the flow of the Chicago River. I mean, talk about undertaking a nearly impossible engineering project. They were going to reverse the flow of the Chicago River. Doing so would purify their drinking water coming from Lake Michigan. So after digging 28 miles of canals and setting many locks and gates along the way, the project was finally completed in 1900. And on January 2nd, a sluice was opened up and a wall of water rushed down into that canal system flowing with such force into the Chicago River that it literally reversed the flow of the river. They reversed the flow of the Chicago River. Chicago grew and flourished from that day forward because now fresh water was flowing from Lake Michigan down through that system, and they were just flourishing. As I think about that story, I just have a question to ask. What if we were to reverse the flow in our lives? What if? What if, rather than always taking from God... What if we started generously giving back to God what we received from him? Here's the thing. Humble generosity, it'll allow God's favor and blessing to flow back into your life like you can't even believe. So I ask you, is it time to reverse the flow? You need to decide. Is it time to reverse the flow? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, 
we love you and we are challenged by your word and your principles. And what a great five weeks it's been as we have gleaned from your word truths about finances and money and life and priorities and what it means to just be wholly 100% in. And Heavenly Father, for each person here, I just pray that you will speak to their heart on this matter of being grateful and content and trusting in you and being humbly generous. May we live faithfully as your people with integrity. And we pray that you would help us to manage our lives and our money well so that you are able to use us to bless others. May we go forth from here today with your blessing, that we might be a blessing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.